Chapter 10 As soon as the immediate game we were watching was finished, the players rose and I greeted Lucio with a good deal of eagerness and effusion. I instinctively guessed from their manner that they looked upon him as an influential member of the club, a person likely to lend them money to gamble with, and otherwise to oblige them in various ways, financially speaking. He introduced me to them all, and I was not slow to perceive the effect my name had upon most of them. I was asked if I would join in a game of Baccarat, and I readily consented. The stakes were ruinously high, but I had no need to falter for that. One of the players near me was a fair-haired young man, handsome in face and of aristocratic bearing. He had been introduced to me as Viscount Linton. I noticed him I noticed him particularly on account of the reckless way he had of doubling his stake suddenly and apparently out of mere bravado, and when he lost, as he mostly did, he laughed uproariously as though he were drunk or delirious. On first beginning to play, I was entirely indifferent as to the results of the game, caring nothing at all as to whether I had losses or gains. Lucio did not join us, but sat apart, quietly observant and watching me, so I fancied, more than anyone. And, as chance would have it, all the luck came my way, and I won steadily. The more I won, the more excited I became, till presently my humor changed, and I was seized by a whimsical desire to lose. I suppose it was the touch of some better impulse in my nature that made me wish for this young Linton's sake, for he seemed literally maddened by my constant winning, and continued his foolhardy and desperate play, his young face grew drawn and sharply thin, and his eyes glittering with a hungry feverishness. The other gamesters, though sharing in his run of ill luck, seemed better able to stand it, or perhaps they concealed their feelings more cleverly. Anyway, I know I caught myself very earnestly wishing that this devil's luck of mine would desert me and set in the young Viscount's direction. But my wishes were no use. Again and again I gathered up the stakes, till at last the players rose, Viscount Linton among them. Well, I'm cleaned out, he said with a loud forced laugh. You must give me my chance of revanche tomorrow, Mr. Tempest. I bowed. With pleasure. He called a waiter at the end of the room to bring him a brandy and soda, and meanwhile I was surrounded by the rest of the men, all of them repeating the Viscount's suggestion of a revanche, and a strenuously and strenuously urging me the necessity of returning to the club the next night in order to give them an opportunity of winning back what they had lost. I readily agreed, and while we were in the midst of talk, Lucio suddenly addressed young Linton. "'Will you make up another game with me?' he inquired. "'I'll start the bank with this,' and he played two crisp notes of five hundred pounds each on the table. There was a moment's silence. The Viscount was thirstily drinking his brandy and soda, and glancing over the rim of his tall tumbler at the notes with covetous bloodshot eyes. Then he shrugged, his shoulders indifferent. "'I can't stake anything,' he said. "'I've already told you. I'm cleaned out. Stony Brook, as, Stony Brook, as the slang goes. It's no use my joining.' "'Sit down, sit down, Linton,' urged one man near him. "'I'll lend you enough to get on with.' "'Thanks. I'd rather not,' he returned, flushing a little." I'm too much in your debt already. Awfully good of you all the same. You go on, you fellows, and I'll watch the play. Let me persuade you, Count Viscount Linton, said Lucio, looking at him with his dazzling, inscrutable smile, just for the fun of things. If you not feel justified in staking money, stake something trifling and merely nominal for the sake of seeing whether this luck will turn. And here he took up a counter. This frequently represents fifty pounds. Let it represent for this once something that is not valuable like money. Your soul, for example. A burst of laughter broke out from all the men. Lucio laughed softly with them. We all have, I hope, enough instruction in modern science to be aware that there is no such thing as a soul in existence, he continued. Therefore, in proposing it as a stake for this game as Baccarat, I really propose less than one hair of your head, because the hair is something, and the soul is nothing, is a nothing. Come! Will you risk that non-existence quantity for the chance of winning a thousand pounds? The Viscount drained off the last drop of brandy and turned upon us, his eyes flushing mingled derision and defiance. Done! he exclaimed, whereupon the party sat down. The game was brief and, in its rapid excitement, almost breathless. Six or seven minutes sufficed, and Lucio rose, the winner. He smiled as he pointed to the counter which had represented Viscount Linton's last stake. 
I have won, he said quietly, but you owe me nothing, dear Viscount, inasmuch as you risked. Nothing. We played this game simply for fun. If souls had any existence, of course, I should claim yours. I wonder if I should do with it. I, w I wonder what I should, I wonder what I should do with it, by the way. He laughed good-humouredly. What nonsense, isn't it? And how thankful we ought to be that we live in advanced days like the present, when such silly superstitions are being swept aside by the march of progress and pure reason. Good night. Tempest and I will give you your full revenge tomorrow. The luck is sure to change by then, and you will probably have the victory. Again, good night. He held out his hand. There was a peculiar melting tenderness in his brilliant dark eyes, an impressive kindness in his manner. Something, I could not tell what, held us all for the moment spellbound, as if by enchantment, and several of the players at other tables, hearing of the eccentric stake that had been wag wagered and lost, looked over at us curiously from a distance. Viscount Linton, however, professed himself immensely diverted, and shook Lucio's preferred hand, proffered hand heartily. "'You're an awfully good fellow,' he said, speaking a little thickly and hurriedly, "'and I assure you, seriously, if I had a soul, "'I should be very glad to part with it for a thousand pounds at the present moment. "'The soul wouldn't be an atom of use to me, and a thousand pounds would, "'but I feel convinced I shall win tomorrow.' "'I am equally sure you will,' returned Lucio affably. "'In the meantime, you will not find my friend—' "'You will not find my friend here, Geoffrey Tempest, a hard creditor. "'He can afford to wait.' But in the case of the lost soul, here he paused, looking straight into the young man's eyes, of course, I cannot afford to wait. The Viscount smiled vaguely at this pleasantry, and almost immediately afterwards left the club. As soon as the door had closed behind him, several of the gamesters exchanged sentious nods and glances. Ruined, said one of them in a sotto voice. His gambling debts are more than he can ever pay, added another. And I hear he has lost a clear fifty thousand on the turf. These remarks were made indifferently, as though one should talk of the weather. No sympathy was expressed, no pity wasted. Every every gambler there was a selfish to the core, and I studied their hardened faces. A thrill of honest indignation moving moved me. Indignation mingled with shame. I was not yet altogether callous or cruel-hearted, though, as I look back upon those days which now resemble a wild vision rather than a reality, I know that I, be I am was becoming more and more of a brutal egoist with every hour I lived. Still, I was so far from I was still far still I was so far then from being utterly vile that I inwardly resolved to write to Viscount Linton that very evening and tell him to consider his debt to me cancelled, as I should refuse to claim it. While this thought was passing through my mind, I met Lucio's gaze fixed steadily upon me. He smiled, and presently signed to me to accompany him. In a few minutes we had left the club, and were out in the cold night air under a heaven of frostily sparkling sky stars. Standing still for a moment, my companion laid his hand on my shoulder. Tempest, if you are going to be kind-hearted or sympathetic to undeserving rascals, I shall have to part company with you, he said, with a curious mixture of satire and seriousness in his voice. I see by the expression of your face that you are meditating some silly, disinterested action of pure generosity. Now you might as just well flop down on these paving stones and begin saying prayers in public. You want to let Linton off his debt. You are a fool for your pains. He is a born scoundrel and has never seen his way to being anything else. Why should you be, should you compassionate him? From this, from the time he first went to college till now, he has been nothing but a, but he has been nothing but his, his, he has, he has been doing nothing but live a life of degraded sensuality. He is a worthless rake, less to be respected than an honest dog. Yet someone loves him, I dare say. "'Someone loves him,' echoed Lucio with an intimidable disdain. "'Bah! Three ballet, girl, ballet girls live on him, if that is what you mean. "'His mother loved him, but she is dead. He broke her heart. "'He is no, he is no good, I tell you. Let him pay his debt in full, "'even to the soul he stakes so lightly. "'If I were the devil now, and had just won the strange game we played tonight, "'I suppose, accordingly to priestly tradition, "'I should be piling up the fire for Linden in high glee. "'But, being what I am, I say let the man alone to make his own destiny. "'Let things take their course, 
and as he chose to risk everything, so let him pay everything. We were, by this time, walking slowly into Paul Mall. I was on the point of making some reply when, catching sight of a man's figure on the opposite side of the way, not far from the Marlowe, Marlborough Club, I uttered an involuntary ex exclamation. Why, there he is, I said. There is Viscount Linton. Lucio's hand closed tightly on my arm. You don't want to speak to him now, surely? No, but I wonder where he's going. He walks rather unsteadily. Drunk, most probably. And Lucio's face presented the same relent relentless expression of scorn I had so often seen and marveled at. We paused a moment, watching the Viscount strolling aimlessly up and down in front of the clubs, till all at once he seemed to come to a sudden resolution, and stopping short, he shouted, Handsome! A silent street a silent wheeled smart vehicle came bowling up immediately. Giving some order to the driver, he jumped in. The cab approached swiftly in our direction. Just as it passed us, the loud report of a pistol crashed on the silence. Good God! I cried, reeling back a step or two. He has shot himself! The hansom stopped. The driver sprang down. Club porters, waiters, policemen, and no end of people starting up from heaven knows where were on the scene in, on, a, on, the, in, on an instance. I rushed forward to join the rapidly gathering throng. But before I could do so, Lucio's strong arm was thrown round me, and he dragged me by main force away. Keep cool, Geoffrey, he said. Do you want to be called up to identify and betray the club and all its members? Not while I am here to prevent you. Check your mad impulses, my good fellow. They will lead you into no end of difficulties. If the man's dead, he's dead, and there is an end of it. Lucio! You have no heart, I exclaimed, struggling violently to escape from his hold. How can you stop to reason in such a case? Think of it. I am the cause of all the mischief. It is my cursed luck at the baccarat this evening that has been the final blow to the wretched young fellow's fortunes. I am convinced of it. I shall never forgive myself. Upon my word, Geoffrey, your conscience is very tender, he answered, holding my arm still more closely and hurrying me away despite myself. You must try to toughen up a little if you want to be successful in life. Your cursed luck, you think, has caused Linton's death. Surely it is a contradiction in terms to call luck cursed. And as for the Viscount, he did not need that last game of Baccarat to emphasize his ruin. You are not to blame. And for the sake of the club, if for nothing else, I do not intend either you or myself to be mixed up in a case of suicide. The coroner's verdict always disposes of these incidents comfortably in two words, temporary insanity. I shuddered. My soul sickened as I thought that within a few yards of us was the bleeding corpse of a man I had so lately seen alive and spoken with, and notwithstanding, Lucio wor notwithstanding Lucio's words, I felt as if I had murdered him.' 